Bloomberg communicated we sat beforehand and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is final summations. And this is the time when we get to discuss the evidence. But I would not presume to tell you how to think. I would not presume to tell you what to think. And I would not presume to tell you how to settle this case. This is a search for the truth. And as judges of the facts, you have the responsibility of deciding what's the truth. And American citizens come here with their problems seeking redress. So you've been elevated, you've been judges, very important function. And we are all together today in the So the evidence comes in a couple of different forms. It comes in the form of paper, which you'll have. It comes in the form of testimony, which you have taken in, listened. Remember, you didn't leave your common sense as a fool. You're here to say, who did what? Who has personal knowledge? Who can tell us something that helps us decide this case? And how do they do that? Well, there are some things that will help you do that. And you've heard some discussions about credibility. What is credibility? Every day somebody wants to sell you insurance, reverse mortgages, cars, the best cars, the best deals, everybody. You may not know it, but I'm your dealer. So in our daily lives, we assess credibility. The first thing that we may look at is the witness's interest in the outcome. The salesman wants a commission. This is the best house for you. And thank you for my commission. That's fun. That's capitalism in America. But when you think about it in this case, each of the parties has an interest in the outcome. And that may influence their testimony. And you're allowed to use that to decide credibility. Uh, the accuracy of what the witness can recall. Now, I called um, Junis to the stand. And I tried to figure out who he was. I asked him questions designed to help you figure out who he was. So we know he's a pretty gifted young man. In high school, he forms an LLC and begins a trucking company. Doesn't have a driver's license. Doesn't. So 2013, I think he said he was a junior. Um, he has an associate. He's going to go to Bloomington College next year. Um, he has his CDL in 2014, has one truck. Um, he works. 2016 as a truck driver for American Asphalt for 11 months. So, what are you thinking about this young man? Well, certainly has the ability to tell the truth if he wants to. Certainly has the ability to keep records because he helps other people in their problems that came in. So, you look at it and say, what is the accuracy of his recollection in connection with issues that are relevant to this case? And what did we learn? We learned that there was a driver of a truck who has never been identified, who left the truck, and in five minutes of the truck, there's a report of a fire engulfing the truck. And we know that Junis, in the very first two or three questions I asked him, said, truck caught fire and burned the building. You're allowed to accept that, because that's an admission of an authorized representative of the defendant. The way this incident happened, truck caught fire and burned the building. That is negligence. Parking the truck near the building that five minutes caught fire is negligence. He also said that the three plaintiffs and their business are innocent. They were not there. They did not contribute in any way to the happening of this incident. These are hardworking Americans. They drive a truck over the road. Reset is an over the road tractor trailer driver right now where he goes off far away places. So nobody was present when this happened. But their things, their important things were in the building because they worked on the trucks to keep them safe, to save money because they had a dream of opening a business where they would have a shop. You heard that testimony. The dream of every dump truck guy is to have his own shop so that he can keep the trucks running. 
So when we look at the accuracy of Junus's recollection, you may have some questions about that. You may have some questions that go from when I ask him questions versus when counsel asks him questions, his own attorney. So um, the ability of the witness to know what he was talking about. He wasn't there. He didn't produce any maintenance records. He said for the first time on the stand that there was an unknown truck driver that his father was checking out that day. But he didn't produce his father. And he didn't produce the driver. And we don't know the condition of the truck. When counsel opened, she said to you that the truck was maintained regularly by the defendants. Did she prove that? It's a question for you. Do you see any receipts, anything that would say that this truck was safe for the road? It had between 800 and 900,000 miles on it. Anything that would indicate that it had been regularly maintained? And the answer is, up to you to recall, I'm not going to tell you what the evidence was, but if you heard anything at all about maintenance of this truck from anybody that knew, the only thing that Juna said was, well, we really didn't take it anywhere else. We did it ourselves. High school student, no mechanical experience, no mechanical training, never was an apprentice. Father and he maintained the truck. We don't know what that means because they never produced a receipt for a single part. Or the radio that they may have installed. Or the clutch. Or anything in connection with this truck. But we do know, and it's admitted, that within five minutes of parking the truck, fire engulfed the truck that led to the building. And based upon your experience and your education and training, you can decide what that means. Now, uh, you're going to take a look at his ability to recall. That's one of the factors that may be important in deciding this case. Contradictions or changes in testimony. Well, asked about other employees, can't remember any names of employees that work for his company. Um, owned one, at least one, so there has to be two drivers. He's not driving. How did they operate two trucks with just his dad? Who he testified was sick, that he wasn't talking to, and that he had been taken off of the business, but did not produce a single document to indicate that. Um, doesn't know the name of the driver. Well, that goes to his credibility. That's one of the factors that you'll consider. Contradictions or changes in testimony. Where can you look for the name of the driver? You can look on the tax records. You can produce a 940 or 941 that says this is a social security number and name of the person we withheld this money from, 1099s, W-2s, all of those things. Who would have those documents? They certainly were not in the truck at the time the truck burned. His accountant would. Did not produce the name of the accountant. On the stand for the first time says, oh, okay, this guy, this guy. So, the judge is going to instruct you as to some other forms of evidence. Now, we know what direct evidence is. Direct evidence is something that you see, you touch, you feel, you hear, you smell. Those are forms of direct evidence based on our senses. Now, my doctor says lose some weight. I call my family. The doctor says lose some weight. Three in the morning, could be hungry. Downstairs at the kitchen table, my daughter comes down. You're eating peanut butter. I have a jar of peanut butter open. I have a spoon. There's peanut butter on my lip. She did not see me eat peanut butter. But she can say, you're eating peanut butter based upon an inference. So circumstantial evidence is a form of inferences. And it can be just as strong or stronger than direct evidence. So part of what you're going to do in this case is decide what inferences lead you to a logical conclusion. Based on all of your education experience and training and your life experiences. Okay, so we know that um, there have been some changes in testimony. 
And you can take that into consideration when you decide this case. Now, Junis testifies seven bills paid range to the plaintiffs. Right. Um, did he have any personal knowledge of that? Could he produce a receipt, a payment, anybody that made the deal? His father. Was he produced as a witness? And the answer is no. And the judge is going to advise you as to a concept called adverse inferences. Adverse interest inferences will be part of a jury instruction. And by the way, anything that I say that contradicts what the judge says, she's in charge, she tells me what it was. If I get it wrong, I apologize. And the facts, anything I say about the facts, it's your recollection that controls, because you're the judges of the facts. So she's going to talk about an adverse inference for not producing the receipts and the account listing, and for not producing dad as a witness. Why is dad somewhat of interest to you? Well, the testimony from the stand for the first time was dad checked out a driver that day, the very day of the fire. Now, two trucks being operated, where is dad? Was he in the truck with the driver or was he not? Does he know about this alleged ability to park by the building or not? Well, you can draw an adverse inference that if Dad testified, he would say there was not a deal. And there was no parking there. By the way, this building that these gentlemen rented, um, it's just one part of a very large complex with many spaces. As you remember, the plaintiff said, there are the parking lots. There are the places to park. This idea of parking the 18-wheeler and violating the lease, he's on the road. He doesn't park it. He can't make any money when he parks it. So he drives all day, all night, as, as loud as possible. My clients testified that they lost their security deposit. They put $3,000 in cameras and electric improvements. So, demeanor of the witness, we all know what that means. We know that sometimes witnesses answer questions clearly, concisely, and directly, and sometimes they don't. You can compare the way Judas answered Ms. Gagan's questions with the way he answered my questions. And when I confronted him with the very same questions from the definition, how he reacted to that. And you can decide his credibility based on the fact that you may have perceived he changed his story. And he has an interest in the outcome of the case, so he has a reason to do it. Uh, did the witness make sense? Judas says, I own this company, then I don't. No paperwork. He says, the truck is maintained, but there are no records. No mechanic, no nothing. Judas says, I have a car there. No evidence. Judas says, the truck caught fire, by the way, Testimony is within five minutes of the driver walking away. Why would Trump do that? It's not for us to prove. They had to produce the records they did. So it's not normal that a vehicle gets parked and within five minutes is in, involved with blame. And you can use your own experience to understand that. People park in garages with cars all the time. They don't catch fire. Whether this is a repair garage or not, of no moment. Was there any evidence that there were any repairs going on at the time? No. Everybody was gone. This truck slipped in there. The driver walked away. Within five minutes, there is a reported fire. That's what happened. Now, there's this other concept in the law that the judge is going to tell you about. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, you can put all this evidence together to decide what happened here. You can look at the photographs. You can look at the documents. You can put the testimony together, that's your job, and reconcile it and discuss it up in any kind of day, discuss the case. Discuss it among yourselves. Does the other evidence support what you just said? Was there a shred of evidence to, dis to support what you said? Now, one of the jury instructions that you're likely to hear is false in one, false in all. And basically the concept is, if someone's willing to lie to you from the stand, you now have a decision to make. So, if a witness deliberately lied, you can reject all or part of his testimony. You can say it was a mistake. You can 
is that to weigh the testimony. And that's really what's going on here. Because every case involves credibility. We were talking a little bit about bad decisions. Okay. So we have this question. What happened that day? Who would you logically want to hear from? You want to hear from dad over who supposedly was involved in the truck that day. Contrast that with the deposition testimony that you heard regarding the owner's failure to be working. So you also want to hear from the driver. Was the truck overheated? Did he leave the truck running when he walked away? Don't hear from anybody. Failure to produce a witness that's naturally expected. You have a right to infer that that party's, that testimony, that witness, that the party didn't call in purpose because it would have been bad for their case. There is a lack of it. Rest is a Literally translated, the thing speaks for itself. I expect that the judge will give you a jury charge on this concept. Rest is a is a concept in negligence where uh, the happening describes the negligence. The truck caught fire and burned the building. That's what brings these plaintiffs to the courtroom. So technically the thing speaks for itself. Understand that the truck was removed within an hour, not because my client said, get it out of here. The guy that owned the whole property, this is from you, has said, get it out of here. So the evidence is gone. The law books, it is set burned in the fire. The receipts wouldn't be kept in the truck. They have taxes to file. They want to use them as deductions. They can have to be with the account, but they weren't produced. So this concept is a permissive inference from the mere happening of the incident. And it shifts the burden away from the plaintiffs. So we have the burden of proof. We have to prove by preponderance of the evidence that something happened that caused us damages. Our position is the fire in the truck burned the building and caused us damages. That's simple. Not very many moving parts except for one dump truck. Now, preponderance of the evidence is another thing that the judge will describe to you. It's a concept in our law. There are basically several standards of proof. Preponderance, the scales of justice, they're equal when you start. None of you have any knowledge of what happened in this case until you heard the evidence and looked at the exhibits. But when the scales of justice tip ever so slightly in favor of the plaintiff, that is a preponderance of the evidence. It's been described as a feather. It's more than a mere scintilla. Some of the she's going to tell you in the correct words. But it's just more likely than not. So in this case, involves a truck parked next to the building and you have a plane within five minutes that burns these gentlemen's property. And basically, it's a theory that you can use decide this case in favor of the plaintiffs. So even though we have the burden of proof, it now shifts. I talked about preponderance. It's, it's just slightly greater weight on the scales of justice. It's not reasonable doubt in a criminal trial. That's where the scales of justice dramatically change. So um, here are some quotes. Seven Hills Transportation, they owned the truck. They had exclusive control of the truck. They had a driver park the truck. The driver walked away within five minutes as they called them back. So you may determine that they had exclusive control of the instrumentality that caused the loss here. The incident suggested by the plaintiffs to you would not have happened if they had used reasonable care. Reasonable care is not leaving the truck in a way that would cause it to catch fire. No one knows. Was it running? Was it overheated? Was something burned up on it? A brake locked? Something that caused it to end up burning almost immediately. And finally, the other part of this is whether or not the plaintiffs did anything to cause this. So is there any evidence that you've heard at all that suggests the plaintiff did anything 
the three, these three gentlemen that were not present to cause this fire. There's no evidence at all. Nothing, certainly, by our preponderance. But there's no evidence at all. There's no evidence of anything inside the building doing anything except the truck caught fire and was so close to the building that it spread. So, based on those concepts, you're going to be taking the case back to the group. Now, we can't create records. We can't produce records that the defendants say they don't have. We can't produce evidence when the truck is gone, salvaged, taken apart, and jumped. This claim didn't even come to fruition for months and years afterwards. And the reason it came to court is because nothing could be decided without you. The picture is given to you to so you would get an idea of the location, that you get an idea of the property that was involved, and the damages that the plaintiff has suffered. The answers to derogatories you know are sworn statements. The plaintiff stands by their statements. It says in that one interrogatory, he had been told not to park there. Well, the landlord made him remove the truck that day. No one said that any of these three gentlemen told him not to park there. They just leased the property. The answers to derogatory said he was told not to park there. And no one ever asked them who made that statement. Now, this is the damages part of the case. Exhibit 2. It's a handwritten list by these gentlemen that says this is what's inside to the best of our ability. How do they come up with numbers for the value? Well, they could look on the internet. They could go back through their records. They could go to the car dealer and say, what are four brand new wheels and tires worth? The invoice for that's dated afterwards. They didn't buy them. They valued them because they wanted their claims to be adjusted. So this is a reconciliation. It goes by the same rules of credibility. They put down everything they thought they had. Now, why would someone keep parts in a building where they do maintenance? Well, if you need a light bulb, you go over the shelf and you get a light bulb. When you use that one up, you go buy another box. Hoses, belts, tires, brakes, wheels, all the things that you need to run various trucks. Their goal was to eventually have an operating shop, but they had to support themselves. They had to work, and they did that. And they used this property whenever they could. So when you look at this, understand that this is based upon their best recollection. They came up with what they thought. And here's an interesting part of it. It says total $28,270.38. And then they subtract $2,000. They said, actually, Recep testified, God wanted that. It was damaged in the fire, but we got $2,000 for it. So we added that back in and subtracted that off our damages. You can use that to determine credibility, honesty, truthfulness. They could have said the whole track was destroyed. They didn't. They said, we salvaged that one, and we got two grand, and we're giving them a credit for it. The lease. This is a written lease. And the written lease is what controls the rental, unless it's changed. And it says, this is the amount of the rent. There is a concept where you continue as a tenant in possession based upon the lease. And you have heard Recep testify.
You heard Reset testify that the landlord said, not what the landlord said, that he was to continue to pay the rent under the same terms as this lease. And you can determine what that means and whether or not that's a change to the lease or an oral lease or a continuation of the lease. Certainly the plaintiffs had every right to that property. Now, Exhibit 4, which you'll have you people already seen, are answers to their arguments. Number 4 says, state the names and addresses of all persons who have knowledge of any facts related to the case. Who is one of those people? The truck driver. The father of Eunice. Mechanic. Accountant. All people with knowledge, all people that have not been called. Here's the answer. On advice of counsel, all persons mentioned in interrogatories exchanged in this matter, all persons mentioned in depositions to be conducted in this matter, agents, servants, or employees of the police department, including the investigating officer on the scene and custodian of the records, all medical and or health personnel rendering care or treatment to the plaintiffs. No blame for personal injury here. Expert witnesses to be named in the near future. No expert witnesses here. All other persons whose identity shall be revealed during the course of continued discovery and at the time of trial. And the answer is no witnesses. Not even Eunice. So you can take all of those things into consideration in deciding this case. And the facts are as you find them. But the bottom line is, this fire in the truck was admitted to have caused the fire in the building by Eunice. He said, I wanted to call them and apologize, but I never got through to them. He also said that the plaintiffs are completely innocent. So based upon the law that the judge is going to give you, and your findings of what really took place here, who did what when, you'll be able to decide this case. The facts handle the framework of the law and will lead you to a conclusion. Now, very serious, this is a significant case for my three clients plus their company because this fire was devastating to them. Very significant to the defendant, too, because he has an interest in this case as well. Every one of them appreciates what you're doing. Every one of them thanks you for your verdict, which will be true and correct and fair under all the facts of this case. You can't ask for anything more. The Constitution guarantees that, and we appreciate the fact that you are agreeing to lend us your life experience to help us resolve this case. Thank you very much. Thank you.